Hello and welcome to this second uh, uh, part of our second look session looking at King Lear and his three daughters, the true uh, history, uh, chronicle history thereof. Uh, we are halfway through the play. Uh, this is a fast run through uh, with uh, energy and pace and enthusiasm and absolutely no planning. Uh, so it's not going to be perfect. Uh, you're going to notice some interesting sort of random cuts where we take out where things uh, go horribly wrong or just were uh, a bit slow. Uh, but the aim is to give you an impression of how the uh, the play flows um, with a, a little bit of uh, dynamite, dynamite up its behind. Um, and uh, we are going from scene 18 to the end of the play and all sorts of things are going down with King Lear and his uh, his three daughters if you want to know more go back to part one starting at part two is a very strange place to start we've also got a first look exploring session over three sessions we read through the play really really slowly and we talked about it at great length uh, so if you want to dive deeper into the text you can do it there um, now we have this wonderful uh, room of readers if you want to find out who they are in more detail and the parts they are playing the uh, there are notes uh, in the uh, in the video feed uh, that you can look at but otherwise, uh, just uh, say hello uh, to Francis, Tamara, Lois, Eric, Liza, Alan, Alexandra, Elizabeth, Emma, Sarah, Dan, Lynn, Helen, Valentina and Bryony. And hopefully I haven't missed anybody out. And I am Robert and uh, we are the company of this second look at King Lear. I will now ask everybody to lurk away, switch off their videos disappear into the ether as we now have an awkward pause while we get ourselves ready. I wonder that the messenger doth stay whom we dispatched for Cambria so long since. If that his answer do not please us well and he do show good reason for delay, I'll teach him how to dally with his king and to detain us in such long suspense. My lord, I think the reason may be this. My father means to come along with him, and thereafter tis his pleasure he shall stay, for to attend upon him the, attend up, upon him on the way. It may be so, and therefore till I know the truth thereof I will suspend my judgment. Uh, and like your grace, there is an ambassador arrived from Gallia, and craves admission, admittance to your majesty. From Gallia? Huh. Why should his, what should his message hither import? Is not your father happily gone thither? Well, whatsoe'er it be, bid him come in, he shall have audience. What news from Gallia? Speak, ambassador. The noble king and queen of Gallia first salute by me, their honorable father, my lord Lear. Next, they commend them kindly to your graces, as those whose welfare they entirely wish. Letters I have to deliver to my Lord Lear, and presents too, if I might speak with him. If you might speak with him? Why, do you think we are afraid that you should speak with him? Pardon me, madam, for I think not so, but say so only. Because he is not there, he's not here. Indeed, my friend, upon some urgent cause, he is at this time absent from the court. But if a day or two you hear repose, um, tis very likely you shall have him here, um, or else have certain notice where he is. Are not we worthy to receive your message? I had in charge to do it himself. It may be then, twill not be done in haste. How doth, how doth my sister brook the air in France? Exceeding well, and never sick one hour, since first she set her foot upon the shore. I am the more sorry. I hope not so, madam. Didst thou not say that she was ever sick since the first hour that she arrived there? No, madam. I said quite contrary. Then I mistook thee. Uh, then she is merry, if she have her health. Oh no, her grief exceeds until the time that she be reconciled unto her father. 
God continue it. What, madam? Why, her health. Amen to that. But God released her grief and sent her father in a better mind than to continue always so unkind. I'll be a mediator in her cause and seek all means to expiate his wrath. Madam, I hope your grace will do the like. Should I be a mean to exasperate his wrath against my sister, whom I love so dear? No, no. To expiate or mitigate his wrath, for he hath misconveyed without a cause. Oh, I! what else? Tis pity it should be so, would it were otherwise. It were great pity it should be otherwise. Then how, madam? Then that they should be reconciled again. It shows you bear an honourable mind. It shows thy understanding to be blind, and that thou hast need of an interpreter. Well, I will know thy message ere it be long, and find a mean to cross it if I can. Come in, my friend, and frolic in our court, till certain notice of my father come. My lord, you are up, er up today before your hour. Tis news to you to be abroad so wrath. Tis news indeed. I am so extreme heavy that I can scarcely keep my eyelids open. And so am I. But I impute the cause to rising sooner than we used to do. Hither my daughter means to come disguised. I'll sit me down and read until she come. She'll not be long, I warrant you, my lord. But say, a couple of these they call good fellows should step out of a hedge and set upon us. We were in a good case for to answer them. But not for us to stand upon our hands. I fear we scant should stand upon our legs. But how should we do to defend ourselves? Even pray to God to bless us from their hands. For fervent prayer much, I'll help, I'll help with stands. I'll sit and pray with you for company. Yet I was ne'er so heavy in my life. Were it not a mad jest if two or three of my profession should meet me and lay me down in a ditch and play rob thief with me and perforce take my gold away from me while I act this stratagem and by this means the grey beard should escape. <laughs> Faith, when I were at liberty again, I would make no more to do but go to the next tree and there hang myself. <laughs> ah, ah, but stay, methinks my youths are here already, and with pure zeal have prayed themselves asleep. I think I know to what intent they came and are provided for another world. And <clears throat> hmm. uh, now I could steer, stab them bravely while they sleep, and in a manner put them to no pain, uh, and doing so I I showed them mighty friendship, uh, for fear of death is worse than death itself, but that my sweet queen willed me for to show this letter to them ere I did the deed. Ooh, mass, they begin to stir. I'll stand aside so I shall come upon them unawares. <laughs> Ah, 
I marvel that my daughter stays so long. I fear we did mistake the place, my lord. God grant we do not miscarry in the place. I had a short nap, but so full of dread, as much amazeth me to think thereof. Fear not, my lord. Dreams are but fantasies and slight imaginations of the brain. Oh, persuade him so, and I'll make him and you confess that dreams do often prove it true. <laughs> I pray, my lord, what was the effect of it? I make no near to guess what it pretends. Leave that to me. I will expound the dream. Methought my daughters, Goneril and Regan, stood be both before me with such grim aspects each brandishing a falchion in their hand, ready to lop a limb off where it fell. And in their other hands, a naked poniard, wherewith they stabbed me in a hundred places. And to think, the, to their thinking, left me there for dead. But then, my youngest daughter, fair Quidella, came with a box of balsam in her hand and poured it into my bleeding wounds, by whose good means I was recovered well, and perfect health, as erst I was before, and with the fear of this I did awake, and yet, for, for fear, my feeble joys do quake. Oh, I'll make you quake for something presently. Stand! Stand! My friend, thou seemest to be... Uh, we, we do, my friend, although with much ado. Oh, no. Deliver! Deliver! Uh -huh. Deliver us, good Lord, from such as he. Ah, oh, you should have prayed before, whilst it was time, and then perhaps you might escape my hands. Uh, but but you, like faithful watchman, fell asleep the, whilst I came and took your uh, halberds from you. <laughs> and now you want your weapons of defence. <laughs> now, have you any hope to be delivered? Hmm? This comes because you have no better stay, but fall asleep when you should watch and pray. My friend, thou seemest to be a proper man. Blood? How the old slave claws me by the elbow! <laughs> he be thinks me like to escape by scraping thus. And it may be are in need of some money. Oh, that to be false. Behold my evidence. If that I have will to do any good, I give it thee, even with a right good will. Uh, uh, here, take mine too, uh, and wish with all my heart to do thee pleasure it were twice as much. <laughs> oh, uh, I'll none of them. They are too light for me. <laughs> well, then, uh, farewell. And if thou have occasion in anything to use me to the queen, tis like enough that I can pleasure thee. Oh, do, 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 do you hear? Do you hear, sir? If, if I had occasion to use you to the Queen, would you do one thing for me that I should ask? Hmm? Aye. Anything that lies within my power. Here's my hand upon it. So, farewell. <laughs> no, no, hear you, sir. Hear you. I pray a, a word with you. Methinks a comely, honest, ancient man should not dissemble with one for advantage. I know when I shall come to try this gear, you will recant from all that you have said. Mistrust him not, but try him when thou wilt. He is her father, and therefore may do much. I know he is, and therefore mean to try him. You are his friend too. I must try you both. Pr Prithee, do! Oh, no, no, to stay, Greybeards, then, and prove men of your words. The Queen hath tied me by a solemn oath here in this place to see you both dispatched. Now, for the safeguard of my conscience, uh, do me the pleasure to, uh, for to um, kill yourselves. So shall you save me labour for to do it, and, and, uh, and prove yourselves true old men of your words. And here I vow, in sight of all the world, I ne'er will trouble you whilst I live again. 
Strike us not with terror, good my friend, nor strike such fear into our aged hearts. Play not the cat which dallieth with the mouse, and on a sudden maketh her our prey. But if thou art marked for the man of death to me and to my Damien, tell me plain that we may be prepared for the stroke and make ourselves fit for the world to come. I am the last of any mortal race that e'er your eyes are likely to behold, and hither sent our purpose to this place to give a final period to your days, which are so wicked and have lived so long that your own children seek to short your life. Came thou from France a purpose to do this? From France? Swoons, do I look like a Frenchman? <laughs> sure! I have not mine own face on. Somebody hath changed faces with me, and I, and I know it not, but I am sure my apparel is all English. Oh, Sarah, what meanest thou to ask that question? I could spoil the fashion of this face for anger. A French face? Because my daughter, whom I have offended, and who at whose hands I have deserved as ill as ever any father did of child, is Queen of France. No thanks at all to me, but unto God, who my injustice see. If it be so that she doth seek revenge, as with good reason she may justly do, I will most willingly resign my life, a, a sacrifice to mitigate her ire. I, I never will entreat thee to forgive, because I am unworthy for to live. Therefore, speak soon, and I will soon make speed whether Cordella will be due to its deed. As I am a perfect gentleman, thou speakest French to me. I, I never heard Cordella's name before, nor never was in France in all my life. I never knew thou hadst a daughter there to whom thou didst prove so unkind a churl, but thy own tongue declares that thou hast been a vile old wretch and full of heinous sin. Ah. No, my friend, thou art deceived much, for her except whom I confess I wronged through doting frenzy and all jealous love. There lives not any under heaven's bright eye that can convict me of impiety, and therefore sure thou dost make mistake the mark, for I am in true peace with all the world. You are the fitter for the King of Heaven, and therefore, for to rid thee of suspense, know thou, the queens of Cambria and Cornwall, thy own two daughters, Goneril and Regan, appointed me to massacre thee here. Why wouldst thou then persuade me that thou art in charity with all the world? <laughs> but now, when thy own issue hold thee in such hate, that they have hired me to abridge thy fate. Oh, fie upon such vile, dissembling breath that would deceive even at the point of death. Am I awake? Or is this but a dream? Oh, fear nothing, man. Thou art but in a dream, and thou shalt never wake till doomsday. But then I hope thou wilt have slept enough. <laughs> yeah. Gentle friend, grant one thing ere I die. I'll grant you anything. Oh, except your lives. Oh. But assure me, by some certain token, that my two daughters hired thee to this deed. If I were once resolved of that, then I would wish no longer life, but crave to die. That to be true. In sight of heaven, I swear. I swear not by heaven for fear of punishment. The heavens are guiltless of such heinous acts. I swear by earth, the, the mother of us all. Swear, swear not by earth, for she abhors to bear such bastards as are murderers of her sons. Why then by hell, and all the devils I swear. I swear not by hell, for that stands gaping wide to swallow thee, and if thou do this deed. I would that word were in his belly again. It have frightened me even to the very heart. This old man is some strong magician. His, his words have turned my mind from this exploit. Then neither heaven, earth, 
nor hell shall shall be witness, but but let this paper witness for them all. Shall I relent, or or shall I prosecute? Shall I resolve, or where I best recant? I will not crack my credit with two queens to whom I have already passed my word. Oh, but my conscience for this act doth tell. I get heaven's hate, earth's scorn, and pains of hell. O oh, just Jehovah, whose almighty power doth govern all things in this spacious world, how canst thou suffer such outrageous act to be committed without just revenge? O oh, viperous generation and accursed to seek his blood whose blood did make them first. Ah, my true friend in all extremity, let us submit us to the will of God. Things past all sense, let us not seek to know. It is God's will and therefore must be so. My friend, I am prepared for this stroke. Strike when thou wilt, and I forgive thee here, even from the very bottom of my heart. But I'm not prepared for to strike. <laughs> Farewell, Perilous. Even the truest friend that ever lived in adversity, the latest kindness I'll request of thee. Is that thou go unto my daughter Cordella and carry her her father's latest blessing. With all desire her, that she will forgive me, for I have wronged her without any cause. Now, Lord, receive me, for I come to thee, and die, I hope, in perfect charity. Dispatch, I pray thee, I have lived too long. Aye, oh, but you are unwise to send an errand by him that never meaneth to deliver it. <laughs> Why, he must go along with you to heaven. It were not good you should go all alone. No doubt, he shall, when by the course of nature he must surrender up his due to death. But that time shall not come till God permit. Ah, uh, nay, presently uh, I bear you company. I, I have a passport for him in my pocket already sealed, and uh, he must needs ride post. <laughs> The, the letter which I read imports not so. It only toucheth me, no word of him. Aye, but the, the Queen commands it must be so, and I, I am paid for him as well as you. <laughs> I, who have borne you company in life, most willingly will bear a share in death. It skilleth not for me, my friend, a wit, nor for a hundred such as Thou and I. No, oh, Barry, do you? but it doth, sir, by your leave. Your, your good days are past. Uh, though it be no matter for you, tis matter for me. Pro proper men are not so rife. <laughs> oh, but beware how thou dost lay thy hand upon the high anointed of the Lord. Oh, be advised, ere thou dost begin. Dispatch me straight, but meddle not with him. Friend. Thy commission is to deal with me, and I am he that hath deserved all. The plot was laid to take away my life, and here it is. I do entreat thee, take it. Yet for my sake, and as thou art a man, spare this, my friend, that hither with me came. I brought him forth, whereas he had not been but for good will to bear me company. He left his friends, his, his country, and his goods, and came with me in most extremity. Oh, if he should miscarry here and die, who is the cause of it but only I? I th that am I. Let that ne'er trouble thee. Oh, no, no, no. Tis I. Had I now to give thee the monarchy of all the spacious world to save his life, I would bestow it on thee. nothing but these tears and prayers and the submission of of a bended knee oh if all this to mercy move thy mind spare him in heaven thou shalt like mercy find i am as hard to be moved as another and yet methinks oh the strength of their persuasion stirs me a little my friend, 
I fear of the almighty power, have power to move thee. We have said enough. But if thy mind be movable with gold, we have not presently to give it thee. Yet to thyself thou mayst do greater good to keep thy hands still undefiled from blood. For do but well consider with thyself when thou hast finished this outrageous act what horror still will haunt thee for the deed? Think this again, that they which would incense thee for to be the butcher of their father, when it is done, for fear it should be known, would make a means to rid thee from the world. Oh, then art thou forever tied in chains of everlasting torments to endure, even in the hottest hole of grisly hell, such pains as never mortal tongue can tell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, heavens be thanked. He will spare my friend. Now, when thou wilt come make an end of me. <sighs> oh. Oh. Happy sight, he means to save my lord. The king of heaven continue this good mind. Why stayest thou to do execution? I am as willful as you for your life. I will not do it. Now you do entreat me. Ah, now I see thou hast some spark of grace. Oh, beshrew you for it, you have put it in me. The parlestest old men that e'er I heard. <laughs> well, to be flat, I'll not meddle with you. Here I found you, and here I'll leave you. If any ask you why the case so stands, say your tongues were better than your hands. Farewell. If ever we together meet, it shall go hard, but I will thee regret. Courage, my lord, the worst is over past. Let us give thanks to God and hire us hence. Thou art deceived, for I am past the best, and know not whither for to go from hence. Death had been better welcome unto me than longer life to add more misery. It were not good to return from whence we came unto your daughter Reagan back again. Now let us go to France, unto Cordella, your youngest daughter, doubtless she will succour you. How can I persuade myself of that, since the other two are quite devoid of love, to whom I was so kind as that my gifts might make them love me, as if twere nothing else? No worldly gifts, but grace from God on high doth nourish virtue and true charity. Remember well what words Cordella spake, what time she, you asked her how she loved your grace. She said her love unto you was as much as ought a child to bear unto her father. But she did find my love was not to her as should a father bear unto a child. That makes not her love to be any less. If she do love you as a child should do, you have tried two. Try one more, for my sake. I'll ne'er entreat you further trial to make. Remember well the dream you had of late, and think what comfort it foretells to us. Come, truest friend that ever man possessed, I know thou counsellest all things for the best. If this third daughter play a kinder part, it comes of God and not of my desert. There is of late news come unto the court that old Lord Lear remains in Cambria. I'll hie me thither presently to impart my letters and my message unto him. I never was less welcome to a place in all my lifetime 
than I have been hither, especially unto the stately queen, who would not cast one gracious look on me, but still with lowering and suspicious eyes would take exceptions at each word I spake, and fain she would have undermined me to know what my ambassador embassage did import. But she is like to hop without her hope, and in this matter, for to want her will, though, by report, she'll have it in all things else. Well, I will pose away for Cambria. Within these few days, I hope to be there. By this, our father understands our mind and our kind greeting sent to him of late. Therefore, my mind presages, ere it be long, we shall receive from Britain happy news. I fear my sisters will dissuade his mind, for she to me hath always been unkind. Fear not, my love, since that we know the worst, the last means help, if that we miss the first. If he'll not come to Gallia unto us, then we will sail to Britain unto him. Well, if I once see Britain again, I'll have sworn I'll ne'er come home without my wench, and I'll not be forsworn. I'd rather never come home while I live. Are you sure, Mumford, she is a maid still? Nay, I'll not swear she's a maid, but she goes for one. I'll take her at all adventures if I can get her. <laughs> Aye, that's well put in. Well put in? Nay, it was ill put in. For had it has been well put in, as ere I put in my dice, I would have made her follow me to France. Nay, you'd have been so kind as take her with you, or else were I as she. I would have been so loving as I'd stayed behind you, yet I must confess you are a very proper man, and able to make a wench do more than she would do. Well, I have a pair of slops for the nonce. We'll hold all your mocks. Nay, we see you have a handsome hose. Aye, and of the newest fashion. More bobs, more. Put them in still. They'll serve instead of bombast. Yet put not in too many, lest the seams crack. And when then they fly out am amongst you again, you must not think to outface me so easily in my mistress quarrel. Who, if I see once again, Ten teams of horses shall not draw me away till I have full and whole possession. Aye, but one team and a cart will serve the turn. Not only for him, but also for his wench. Well, you are two to one. I'll give you over. And since I see you so pleasantly disposed, which indeed is but seldom seen, I'll claim a promise of you, which you shall not deny me. For promise is debt. And by this hand you promised it me, therefore you owe it me, and you shall pay it me, or I'll sue you upon an action of unkindness. Prithee, Lord Mumford, what promise did I make thee? Faith, nothing but this, that the next fair weather, which is very now, you would go in progress down to the seaside, which is very near. Faith, in this motion I will join with you, with thee, and be a mediator to my queen. Prithee, my love, let this match go forward. My mind foretells twill be a lucky voyage. Entreaty needs not where you may command. So you be pleased, I am right well content. Yet as the sea I much desire to see, so am I most unwilling to be seen. Well, go disguised, all unknown to any. Howsoever you make one, I'll make another. And I the third. Oh, I'm overjoyed. See what love is, which getteth with the world, what all the world besides could ne'er obtain. But what disguises shall we have, my lord? Faith, thus. My queen and I will be disguised like a plain country couple, and you shall be Roger, our man, and wait upon us. Or if you will, you shall go first, and we will wait on you. To a more than time. This device is excellent. Come, let us about it. What strange mischance or unexpected hath hath thus deprived us of our father's presence? Can no man tell us what's become of him, with whom he did, we did converse not two days since? My lords. Now let everywhere light horse be said to scour about through 
all our regiment dispatch a post immediately to Cornwall to see if any news of him be there. Myself will make a strict inquiry here and all about our cities near at hand to certain news that his abode be brought. All sorrow is but counterfeit to mine, whose lips are almost sealed up with grief. Mine is the substance, whilst they do but seem to weep the loss which tears cannot redeem. Oh, there was heard so strange a misadventure, a thing so far beyond the reach of sense. Since no man's reason in the cause can enter, what hath removed my father thus from hence? Oh, I do fear some charm or invocation of wicked spirits or the infernal fiends stirred by Cordella moves this innovation and brings my father timeless to his end. But might I know that the detested witch were certain cause of this uncertain ill, myself to France would go in some disguise and with these nails scratch out her hateful eyes. For since I am deprived of my father, I loathe my life, and with my death the rather. The heavens are just and hate impiety, and will no doubt reveal such heinous crimes. Censure not any till you know the right. Let him be judged that bringeth truth to light. Ah, oh, but my grief, like to a swelling tide, exceeds the bounds of common patience. Nor can I moderate my tongue so much to conceal them, whom I hold in suspect. The ma this matter shall be sifted. If it be she, a thousand Frances shall not harbour her. All happiness unto the Cambrian king. Welcome, my friend. From whence is thy embassage? I came from Gallia, unto Cornwall sent with letters to your honourable father, whom there not finding, as I did expect, I was directed hither to repair. Frenchman, what is thy message to my father? My letters, madam, will import the same, which my commission is for to deliver. In his absence, you may trust us with your letters. I must perform my charge in such a manner as I have strict commandment from the king. No, oh. there is good packing twixt your king and you. You need not hither come to ask for him. You know where he is better than ourselves. Madam, I hope not far off. Hath the young murderess, your outrageous queen, no means to colour her detested deeds in finishing my guiltless father's days? because he gave her nothing of a dower, but by the colour of a feigned embassage to send him letters hither to our court. Oh, go! Carry them to them that sent them hither, and bid them keep their scrolls unto themselves. They cannot blind us with such slight excuse to smother up so monstrous vile abuse. And were it not it against the law of arms to offer violence to a messenger, we would inflict such torments on thyself as should enforce thee to reveal the truth. Madam, your threats no whit appall my mind. I know my conscience guiltless of this act. Huh. My king and queen, I dare be sworn, are free from any thought of such impiety. And therefore, madam, you have done them wrong, and ill beseeming with a sister's love, who in mere duty tender him as much as ever you respected him for dower. The king, your husband, will not say as much. I suspend my judgment for a time till more appearance give us further light. Yet to be plain, your coming doth enforce a great suspicion to our doubtful mind and that you do resemble, to be brief, him that first robs and then cries, Stop the thief. Pray God, some near you have not done the like. Hence, saucy mate. <coughs> Rep 
reply no more to us. The law of arms shall not protect thy tongue. Ne'er was I offered such discourtesy. God and my king, I trust ere it be long, will find a mean to remedy this wrong. How shall I live to suffer this disgrace at every base and vulgar peasant's hands? It ill befitteth my imperial state to be thus used, and no man to take my part. What should I do? Oh. If the law of arms were to my everlasting obloquy. But I will take revenge upon his master, which sent him hither to delude us thus. Nay, if you put up with this, be sure ere long, now that my father is thus made away, she'll come and claim a third part of your crown, as due unto her by inheritance. But I will prove her title to be naught but shame and the reward of parricide, and make her an example to the world for after ages to admire her penance. This I will do, as I am Cambria's king, or lose my life to prosecute revenge. Come first, let's learn what news is of our father, and then proceed as best occasion fits. My honest friends, we are ashamed to show the great extremity of our present state in that at this time we are bought so low that we want money for to pay our passage. The truth is, so we met with some good fellows a little before we came aboard your ship, which stripped us quite of all the coin we had and left us not a penny in our purses. Yet wanting money, we will use the mean to see you satisfied to the uttermost. Here's a good gown, twould become me passing well. I should be fine in it. Here's a good cloak. I marvel how I should look in it. Faith, had we others to supply the room, though ne'er so mean, you willingly should have them. Uh, do you hear, sir? Uh, you look like an honest man. I'll not stand to do you a pleasure. Here's a good, strong, motley gabardine. Cost me 14 good shillings at Billingsgate. Give me your gown for it, and your cap for mine, and I'll forgive your passage. With all my heart, and 20 thanks. Ah. You hear, sir? You shall have a better match than he because you are my friend. Here is a good sheep's russet sea gown, will bide more stress, I warrant you, than two of his. Yet, for you seem to be an honest gentleman, I am content to change for your cloak and ask you nothing for your passage more. My own I willingly would change with thee and think myself indebted to thy kindness. But would my friend might keep his garment still? My friend, I'll give thee this new doublet. If thou wilt, restore his gown unto him back again. Nay, if I do, I would I be, I might ne'er eat powdered beef and mustard more, nor drink can of good liquor whilst I live. My friend, you have small reason to seek to hinder me of my bargain. Uh, but the best is, a bargain's a bargain. Kind friend, it is much better as it is. For by this means, we may escape unknown till time and opportunity do fit. Hark, hark. They are laying their heads together. They'll repent them of their bargain anon. It were best for us to go while we are well. Uh, God be with you, sir. Uh, for your passage back again, I'll use you as unreasonable as another. I know thou wilt but we hope to bring ready money with us when we come back again. Forever men in this extremity, in a strange country and devoid of friends, and not a penny for to help ourselves. Kind friend, what thinkest thou will become of us? Be of good cheer, my lord. I have a doublet will yield us money enough to serve our turns until we come unto your daughter's court.
And then I hope we shall have friends enough. Ah, kind, perilous. That is it, I fear, and makes me faint or ever I come there. Can kindness spring out of ingratitude or, or love be reaped where hatred hath be, been sown? Can henbane join in league with Mithridate or sugar go in, in wormwood's bitter stalk? It cannot be. They are too opposite. And so am I to any kindness here. I have thrown wormwood on the sugared youth and like to henbane poisoned the fount whence flowed the Mithridate of a child's goodwill. I, like an envious thorn, have pricked the heart and turned sweet grapes to sour, unrelished sloes. The causeless ire of my respectless breast hath soured the sweet milk of dame nature's paps. My, uh, my bitter words have galled her honey thoughts, and weeds of rancor choked the flower of grace. Th then what remainder is of any hope but all our fortunes will go quite a slope. Fear not, my lord. The perfect good indeed can never be corrupted by the bad. Or new fresh vessels still retains the taste of that which first is poured into the same. And therefore, though you name yourself the thorn, the weed, the gall, the henbane and the wormwood, yet she'll continue in her former state the honey milk, grape, sugar, mithridate. Ah, thou pleasing orator unto me in woe, cease to beguile me with thy hopeful speeches. Join with me and think of naught but crosses and we, then we'll one, one lament another's losses. Why, say the worst. The worst can be but death and death is better than for to despair then hazard death, which may convert to life. Banish despair, which brings a thousand deaths. All come with thy strong arguments. I yield to be directed by thee as thou wilt, as thou yieldest comfort to my crazed thoughts. Would I come yield the like unto thy body, which is full weak, I know, and ill appaid for want of fresh meat and, and due sustenance. Alack, my lord, my heart doth bleed to think that you should be in such extremity. Come, let us go and see what God will say. When all means fail, he is the surest friend. This tedious journey all on foot, sweet love, cannot be pleasing to your tender joints, which ne'er were used to these toilsome walks. I never in my life took more delight in any journey than I do in this. It did me good when as we happed to light amongst the merry crew of country folk to see what industry and pains they took to win them commendations amongst their friends. Lord, how they labor to the bestir themselves and in their quirks to go beyond the moon and so take on them with such antic fits that one would think they were beside their wits. Come away, Roger, with your basket. Soft dame, here comes a couple of old youths. I must needs make myself fat with jesting at them. Nay, prithee do not. They do seem to be men much are gone with grief and misery. Let's stand aside and hearken what they say. Ah, uh, my perilous. Now I see we both shall end our days in this unfruitful soil. Do I faint for want of sustenance? And, and thou I know in little better case, no gentle affords one taste of fruits to comfort us until we meet with men. No lucky path conducts our luckless steps into a place where any comfort dwells. Sweet breast betide unto our happy souls for here, I see our bodies must have end. Oh, my dear Lord, how doth my heart lament to see you brought to this extremity? Oh, if you love me as you do profess, or ever thought well of me in my life, feed on this flesh, whose veins are not so dry, but there is virtue left to comfort you, Oh, feed on this. 
If this will do you good, I'll smile for joy to see you suck my blood. I am no cannibal. I should delight and <laughs> slake my hungry jaws with human flesh. I am no devil or 10 times worse than so to suck the blood of such a peerless friend. <laughs> Do not think that I respect my life so dearly as I do thy loyal love. Ah, Britain, I shall never see thee more that hast unkindly banished thy king. And yet thou dost not make me to complain, but they were which, which were more near to me than thou. What do I hear? This lamentable voice methinks ere uh, now I oftentimes have heard. Ah, gone a real. Was half my kingdom's gift the cause that thou didst seek to have my life? Ah, oh, cruel Reagan, did, did I give thee all, and all could not suffice without my blood? Ah, oh, poor Cordella, did I give thee not, nor never shall be able for to give? <sighs> Let me warn all ages that ensueth, how they trust flattery and reject the truth. Well, unkind girls, I here forgive you both, yet the just heavens will hardly do the like and only crave forgiveness at the end of good Cordella and of thee, my friend, of God, whose majesty I have offended by my transgression many thousand ways, of her dear heart, whom I for no occasion turned out of all through flatterer's persuasion, of thee, kind friend, who, but for me, I, I know, hadst never come unto this place of woe. Alack, that ever I should live to see my noble father in this misery. Sweet love, reveal not what thou art as yet, until we know the ground of all this ill. Oh, but some, some meat, some meat, do you not see how near they are to death for want of food? Lord, which didst help thy servants at their need, now or never send us help with speed. Oh, comfort, comfort. Yonder is a banquet and men and women. My Lord, be of good cheer for I see comfort coming very near. Oh, my Lord, a banquet and men and women. Let kind pity mollify their hearts, that they may help us in our great extremes. God save your friends, and if this blessed banquet affordeth any food or sustenance, even for his sake that saved us all from death, vouchsafe to save us from the grip of famine, here, Father, sit and eat here, sit and drink, and would it were far better for your sakes. I give you thanks anon. My friend doth faint and needeth present comfort. Aren't you ne'er stays to say grace? Oh, there's no sauce to a good stomach. The blessed God of heaven hath thought upon us. This be his, and these kind, courteous folk by whose humanity we are preserved. And may that wrought be unto him, as was that which old Aeson drank, which did renew his withered age and made him young again. And may that meat be unto him, as was that which Elias ate, in strength whereof he walked forty days and never fainted. Shall I conceal me longer from my father? Or shall I manifest myself to him? Forbear a while, until his strength return, lest, being overjoyed with seeing thee, his poor weak senses should forsake their office, and so, cause, so our cause of joy be turned to sorrow. What well, cheer, my lord? How do you feel yourself? <laughs> Methinks I never saw such savoury meat. It is as pleasant as the blessed manna that reigned from heaven amongst the Israelites. It hath recalled my spirits home again and, and made me fresh as erst I was before. But how shall we congratulate their kindness? In faith, 
Uh, I know not how sufficiently. But the best means it that I can think of is this. I'll offer them my doublet in requital, for we have nothing else to spare. Stay, stay perilous, for they shall have mine. Pardon me, my lord, I swear they shall have mine. Who would think such kindness should remain amongst a strange, such strange and unacquainted men, and that such hate should harbor in the breast of those which have occasion to be best? Good old father, tell to me thy grief. I'll sorrow with thee, if not add relief. Ah, good young daughter, I may call thee so, for thou art like a daughter I did owe. Do you not owe her still? What? Is she dead? Oh, God forbid. But all my interests gone by showing myself too much unnatural. So I have lost the title of a father and may be called a stranger to her rather. Your title's good still, for it is always known. A man may do as him list with his own. But have you but one daughter then in all? Yes, I have more by two than one I, would I had. Oh, say not so, but rather see the end. They that are bad may have the grace to mend. But how have they offended you so much? If from the first I should relate the cause, twould make a heart of adamant to weep. And thou, poor soul, so kind-hearted as thou art, dost weep already ere I do begin. For God's love, tell it, and when you have done, I'll tell the reason why I weep so soon. Then know this first. I am a Briton born, and had three daughters by one loving wife. And, and though I say it of beauty, they were sped, especially the youngest of the three, for her perfections hardly match could be. On these, I doted with a jealous love, and thought to try which of them loved me best by asking them which would do most for me. The first and second flattered me with words, and now they love me better than their lives. The youngest said she loved me as a child might do. Her answer I esteemed most wild, and presently in an outrageous mood, I turned from me to go sink or swim. I turned her from me to go sink or swim, and all I had, even to the very clothes, I gave in dowry to with the other two. And she that best deserved the greatest share, I gave her nothing but disgrace and care. Now, mark the sequel. When I had done thus, I sojourned in my eldest daughter's house, where for a time I was entreated well, and lived in state sufficing my content. But every day her kindness did grow cold, which I with patience put up well enough, and seemed not to see the things I saw. But at the last, she grew so far incensed with moody fury and with, with causeless hate that in most vile and contemptuous terms, she bade me pack and harbor somewhere else. Then I was fain for refuge to repair unto my other daughter for relief, who gave me pleasing and most courteous words, but in her actions showed herself so sore as never any daughter did before. She prayed me in a morning out the time to go to a thicket two miles from the court, pointing that there she would come talk with me. There she had set a shag-haired murdering wretch to massacre my honest friend and me. Then judge yourself, although my tale be brief, if ever may had greater cause of grief. No, never like impiety was done since the creation of the world begun. And now I am constrained to seek relief of her to whom I have been so unkind, whose censure, if it do award me death, I must confess she pays me but my due. But if she show a loving daughter's part, it comes of God and her, not my desert. No doubt she will. I dare be sworn she will. How know you that, not knowing what she is? Myself a father have a great way hence. Used me as ill as ever you did her. Yet that his reverend age I once might see, I'd creep along to meet him on my knee. Oh. No men's children are unkind, but mine. Condemn not all because of others' crime. But look, dear father, look, behold, and see. 
Thy loving daughter speaketh unto thee. Oh, stand, stand thou up. It, it is my part to kneel and ask forgiveness for my former thoughts. Oh, if you wish I should enjoy my breath, dear father, rise, or I receive my death. Then I will rise to satisfy your mind, but kneel again to pardon, be resigned. I pardon you, the word beseems not me, but I do say so for to ease your knee. You gave me life, you were the cause that I am what I am. Who else had never been? But you gave me life to me and to my friend, whose days had else had end had an untimely end. You brought me up when I was but young, and far unable for to help myself. I cast thee forth when as thou wast but young, and far unable for to help thyself. God, world and nature say I do you wrong that can endure to see you kneel so long. Let me break off this loving controversy which doth rejoice my very soul to see good father rise she is your loving daughter and honors you with a respective duty as if you were the monarch of the world but i will never rise from off my knee until i have your blessing and your pardon of all my faults committed any way from my first birth unto this present day. The blessing which the God of Abraham gave unto the tribe of Judah, light on thee and multiply thy days, that thou mayst see thy children's children prosper after thee. Thy faults, which are just none that I do know, God pardon on high and I forgive below. Now is my heart at quiet and doth leap within my breast for joy of this good hap. And now, dear father, welcome to our court and welcome, kind perilous unto me, mirror of virtue and true honesty. Oh, he hath been the kindest friend to me that ever man had in adversity. M my tongue doth fail to say what heart doth think. I am so ravished with exceeding joy. All you have spoke, now let me speak my mind, and in few words much matter here conclude. If e'er my heart to harbour any joy, or true consent repose within my breast, till I have rooted out this viperous sect, and repossessed my father of his crown, let me be counted for the perjured man that e never spake word since the word world began. Let me pray too that never prayed before, if e'er I resalute the British earth. As e'er it be long, I do presume I shall, and do return from thence without my wench. Let me be gilded for my recompense. Come. Let's to arms for to, to redress this wrong. Till I am there, methinks, the time seems long. I feel a hell of conscience in my breast, tormenting me with horror for my fact. That makes me in an agony of doubt for fear the world should find my dealing out. The slave whom I appointed for the act. I ne'er set eye upon the peasant since. Oh. Could I get him for to make him sure? My doubts would cease and I should rest secure. But if the old men with persuasive words have saved their lives and made him to relent, then are they fled unto the court of France and like a trumpet manifest my shame. Oh, a shame on those white livered slaves, say I, that with their words so soon are overcome. Oh, God! That 
I had been but made a man, or that my strength were equal with my will. These foolish men are nothing but mere pity, and melt as butter doth against the sun. Why should they have preeminence over us? Since we are creatures of more brave resolve, I swear, I am quite out of charity with all the heartless men in Christendom. A pox on them when they are afraid to give a stab or slit a paltry windpipe, which are so easy matters to be done. Well, had I thought the slave would serve me so, myself would have been executioner. Tis now undone, and, if that it be known, I'll make as good shift as I can for one. He that repines at me, howe'er it stands, it were best for him to keep him from my hands. <laughs> Thus have we brought our army to the sea, whereas our ships are ready to receive us. The wind stands fair, and we in four hours sail may easily arrive on British shore, where unexpected we may su them surprise, and gain a glorious victory with ease. Wherefore, my loving countrymen, resolve, since truth and justice fighteth on our sides, that we shall march with conquest where we go. Myself will be as forward as the first, and step by step march with the hardiest wight, and not the meanest soldier in our camp shall be in danger, but I'll second him. To you, my lord, we give you the whole command of all the army next unto ourself, not doubting of you, but you will extend your wanted valour in this needful case, encouraging the rest to do the like by your approved magnanimity. A liege, tis needless to spur a willing horse that's apt enough to run himself to death. For here I swear by that sweet saint's bright eye, which are the stars which guide me to good hap, either to see my old lord crowned anew, or in his cause to bid the world adieu. Thanks, good Lord Mumford. Tis more of your good will than any merit or desert in me. And now to you, my worthy countrymen, ye valiant rate of Genovestian Gauls, surnamed Redshanks, for your chivalry, because you fight up to the shanks in blood. Show yourselves now to be right Gauls indeed, and be so bitter on your enemies that they may say you are as bitter as Gaul. Gaul them. Brave shot with your artillery, gall them, brave halberds with your sharp point bills, each in their pointed place, not one, but all. Fight for the credit of yourselves and gall. Then what should more persuasion need to those than rather wish to deal than hear of blows? Let's to our ships, and if that God permit, in four hours sail, I hope we shall be there. And in five hours more, I make no doubt, but we shall bring our wished desires about. My honest friends, it is your turn tonight to watch in this place near about the beacon, and vigilantly have regard if any fleet of ships pass hitherward, which if you do, your office is to fire the beacon presently and raise the town. Aye, aye, I fear nothing. We know our charge, I warrant. I have been watchman about this beacon this thirty year, and yet I ne'er seen it stir, but stood as quietly as might be. Faith, neighbour, and you'll follow my voice instead of watching the beacon. We'll go to Goodman Jennings, <laughs> watch a pot of ale, and a rasher of bacon. And if we do not drink ourselves drunk, then stop. A warrant, the beacon will see us when we come out again. Aye! But how if somebody excuse us to the captain? 
is no matter. I'll prove, by good reason, that we watch the beacon as, for example. I, I hope you do not call me ass by craft neighbor. No, no, but for example, mm. here, say, here stands the pot of ale. That's the beacon. I, I, it is a very good beacon. Well, say, here stands your nose. Ah. Quiet. Oh, indeed, I must confess, it is somewhat red. <laughs> I see come marching in a dish, half a score pieces of salt bacon. Ah, uh, I understand your meaning. That's as much to say, half a score ships. True, you can't still write. Yeah, presently, like a faithful watchman, I fire the beacon and call up the town. Ah, hi! That's as much to say. You set your nose to the pot and drink up the drink. You are in the right. Come, let's go fire the beacon. <laughs> now march our ensigns on the British earth, and we are near approaching to the town. Then look about you, valiant countrymen, and we shall finish this exploit with ease. The inhabitants of this mistrustful place are dead asleep as men that are secure. Here shall we skirmish, but with naked men, devoid of sense, you wake it from a dream that know not what our coming doth pretend, till they do feel our meaning in their skins. Therefore a sail, God and our right for us. Where are these villains that were set to watch and fire the beacon? If occasion serves, that thus have suffered us to be surprised and never given notice to the town. We are betrayed and quite devoid of hope by any means to fortify ourselves. Tis ten to one, the peasants are overcome with drink and sleep, and so neglect their charge. A whirlwind carry them quick to a whirlpool, that there the slaves may drink their bellies full. This tis to have the beacon so near the alehouse. <laughs> Out on you villains! Whither run you now? <laughs> Fire the town and call up the beacon! Oh, no, sir, to fire the beacon. <laughs> what, with a pot of ale, you drunken rogue? You'll fire the beacon when the town is lost. I'll teach you how to tend your office better. Yield, yield. Yield! Real? We do not reel! You. you may lack a pot of ale ere you die! But in Where? mean space I answer you want none! There's no dealing with him, ye tall men and well weaponed! I would there were no worse than you in the town! Yeah. I, uh, I, I speaks like an honest man! My collar's passed already! <laughs> Come, neighbour, let's go! Ne and first, let's see and we can stand. Fear not, my friends. You shall receive no hurt if you'll subscribe unto your lawful king and quite revoke your fealty from Cambria and from aspiring Cornwall too, whose wives have practised treason against their father's life. We come in justice of your wronged king, and do intend no harm at all to you. So you submit unto your lawful king. Kind countrymen, it grieves me that perforce I am constrained to use extremities. Long have you been looked for, good my lord, and wished for by general consent. And had we known your highness had arrived, we had not made resistance to your grace. And now, my gracious lord, you need not doubt, but all the country will yield presently, which, since your absence, have him greatly taxed, for to maintain their overswelling pride. 
We'll presently send word to all our friends mm -hmm. when they have noticed, they will come at base. Thanks, loving subjects, and thanks, worthy son. Thanks, my kind daughter. Thanks to you, my lord, who willingly adventured have your blood without desert to do me so much good. Oh, say not so. I've been much beholden to your grace. I must confess, I have been in some skirmishes. I was never in the like to this. But where I was wont to meet with armoured men, I was now encountered with naked women. We that are feeble and want use of arms will pray to God to shield you from all harms. While your hands do manage ceaseless toil, our hearts shall pray, the foes may have the foil. We'll fast and pray while you for us do fight that victory may prosecute the right. Methinks your words do amplify my friends and add fresh vigour to my willing limbs. But hark, I hear the adverse drum approach. God and our right, St. Denis and St. George. Presumptuous King of Gauls, how darest thou presume to enter on our British shore? And more than that, to take our towns perforce and draw our subjects' hearts from their true king. Be sure to buy it at as dear a price as e'er you bought presumption in your lives. Or oh, daring Cornwall, no, we came in right and just revengement of the wronged king whose daughter there, daughters there, well, vipers as they are, have sought to murder and deprive of life. But God protected him from all their spite, and we are come in justice of his right. Nor he nor thou have any interest here but what you win and purchase with the sword. Thy slander to our noble virtuous queens will in the battle thrust them down thy throat except for fear of our revenging hands, thou fly to sea and not secure our land on land. Welshman, I'll so ferret you ere night for that word, that you shall have no mind to crake so well this twelve months. They lie that say we sought our father's death. Tis merely forged for a colour's sake to set a gloss on your invasion. Methinks an old man, ready for to die, should be ashamed to broach so foul a lie. Fie, shameless sister, so devoid of grace to call our father liar to his face. Peace, Puritan, dissembling hypocrite, which art so good that thou wilt prove stark naught. Anon, when, as I have you in my fingers, I'll make you wish yourself in purgatory. Nay, peace, thou monster, shame unto thy sex, thou fiend in likeness of a human creature. I never heard a fouler spoken man. Out on thee, viper, scum, filthy parasite, more odious to my sight than is a toad. Knowest thou these letters? <laughs> Think you to outface me with your paltry scrolls? You come to drive my husband from his right under the colour of a forged letter. Whoever heard the like impiety? You are our debtor of more patience. We were more patient when we stayed for you within the thicket two long hours and more. What hours? What thicket? There where you sent your servant with your letters, sealed with your hand, to send us both to heaven. Whereas I think you never mean to come. Alas, you are grown a child again with age, or else your senses don't for want of sleep. Indeed, you made us rise betimes, you know. Yet had a care we should sleep where you bade us stay. But never more, never wake more till the latter day. Peace, peace, old fellow. Thou art sleepy still. Faith, and if you reason till tomorrow, you get no other answer at their hands. 
It is pity two such good faces should have so little grace between them. Well, let us say if their husbands with their hands can do as much as they do with their tongues. Aye, with their swords they'll make your tongue unsay what they have said, or else they'll cut them out. To it, gallant, to it. Let's not stand brawling thus. The day is lost. Our friends do all revolt and join against us with the adverse part. There is no means of safety but by flight. And therefore I'll to Cornwall with my queen. Um, uh, I think there is a devil in the camp hath haunted me today. He hath so tired me that in manner I can fight no more. Soons, here he comes. Farewell, Welshman. Give thee but thy due. Thou hast a light and nimble pair of legs. Thou art more in debt to them than to thy hands. But if I meet thee once again today, I'll cut them off and send them to a better heart. Thanks be to God, your foes are overcome, and you again possessed of your right. First to the heavens. Next, thanks to you, my son, by whose good means I repossess the same, which if it please you to accept yourself with all my heart, I will resign to you. For it is yours by right and none of mine. First, have you raised at your own charge a power of valiant soldiers? This comes all from you. Next, have you ventured your own person's scathe? And lastly, worthy galleon never stains my kingly title I by thee have gained. Thank heavens, not me. My zeal to you is such, command my utmost, I will never grudge. He that with all kind love entreats his queen will not be to her father unkind seen. Ah, my Cordella, now I call to mind the modest answer which I took unkind. But now I see, I am no whit beguiled. Thou lovest me dearly, and as aught a child. And thou, perilous, partner once in woe, thee to requite the best I can, I'll do. Yet, all I can, I, where it ne'er so much were not sufficient, thy true love is such. Thanks, worthy Mumford, to thee, last of all, not greeted last, cause thy des desert was small. No, thou hast lion-like laid on today, chasing the Cornwall king and Cambria, who with my daughters, daughters, did I say? To save their lives, the fugitives did play. Come, son and daughter, who did me advance, Repose with me a while, and then for France. And thus closes the session. Uh, return uh, to the fray, people. Uh, wonderful, wonderful things there. Uh, as we got to grips with the general shape of things. Um, uh, things went well, things went badly. Things happened. That's, that's all that really matters. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I've got a much better sense of the shape of things. I love the watch, by the way. Very well <laughs> oh, done, watch. Watch cleaning, task. cleaning the drunk nose. Uh, the the the. the... I forgotten it was there. <laughs> so I just saw myself. I was like, what? Uh, nice bit of nose blusher there. Um, yeah, because oh, we were noting it in the uh, the chat this sort of question. You know, why 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 is Cordella not on on out with the forces and just uh, that that sneaking suspicion that uh, it might be doubling with uh, with some of the watch and especially if they are young people then that sort of makes sense um, so that sort of uh, explains that we do have a uh, a better sense of the shape of it uh, it's uh, I've, I've still got the question of where in a production would I put the interval 
uh, which is not a simple, simple uh, question mm -hmm. to answer. Um, but yeah, uh, th initial thoughts from the room uh, about this half. It's a much more fiddly half. First mm -hmm. half was much, very straightforward in real terms. Yeah. You know, where <clears throat> there were scenes, people went on and off. Um, this this had a lot more moving parts. Lynn. Yes, but for all that, it, it, I feel like the first half, as we divided it, was more plot driven. And the second part is more sort of set pc -y. So there's a little set piece with the comic routine between the messenger and the daughter where she's saying things that can be deliberately misinterpreted and the messenger's like, what are you saying? So that like a little comic set piece there. And that rather extended um, scene between the would-be assassin and his would-be victims, which is a little long. Um, uh, and then, you know, Reagan has a, has a I, I think it is, has a, has a you know kind of a set piece monologue later on, so I th I think pace in the second half is something that the production would have to be quite attentive to because um, the, I mean the set the, the the moments are really nice in themselves, but it, it's kind of like the plot isn't moving forward very quickly. My impression. We've got yeah we've got these two. I mean the the messenger uh, uh, murdery scene uh, is just massive um, and. I I I, th I think it functions better with physicality. I, I was very aware of the the, the problems of of uh, that it needs movement to it. But also we got this massive reconciliation scene as well, which is which is not a short scene. Um, lovely, lovely though it is. Um, so the, the yeah, it, the second half is doing slightly different things. It, it's like we have this sort of oasis. We've had relatively even number of scenes for the first half then we have a series of slower or not necessarily slower but longer set pieces and then we go into action 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 close um uh so yes yeah, uh, there, there, there is an interesting shape to it um but yeah it's much more business heavy you know all this handing over of props uh things uh and, and that stuff which is quite difficult to get right here and also we don't get the full impact of the kneeling um, it, uh, that, that's going on in that scene here. And, and in many ways, the scene is a lot more affecting, I think, in this version. Whereas mm. when you've got people literally kneeling, in, uh, it, 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 it leads to a lot more comedy, uh, which is not an inherently bad thing uh, for the scene, but it's a different tone to, I think, what we got here. Francis? Yeah, um, in, in place of kneeling in that scene, I just took off my cap and kind of held it to my chest. So mm. for me, it works better, I think. Mm. Uh, yeah, other thoughts, first impressions, uh, uh, feelings about that. Uh, Sarah? Just um, carrying on from what you said. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel in a way it works better without the kneeling in a, in a way, although I did like what Dan was doing with his, with his different... Mm. camera angles to show the kneeling but I think honestly having having now read it again and and that seeing that scene play play through in the way it did I think it would be a shame to bring comedy into that scene with you know physical on stage business with kneeling and whatnot because honestly it was so affecting and you guys all four of you honestly you had me in tears practically and I had to kind of pull myself together and gather so that I could come on and bitch immediately afterwards but it was so so moving i've never been so moved by something on zoom before it was awesome so i i don't know in a way i feel that we've sort of found a way into that scene that that makes it it, it would almost be a shame to do it with any comedy that's going to you know lighten the mood because it was just so affecting i, I thought you yeah. Uh, other thoughts. I mean, uh, 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 the the uh, you you're talking about uh, uh, what what you you had to do immediately afterwards. I mean, your speech there is is so good. Um... <laughs> she the thing that I love about um, Reagan, the, well, the, the way she's written is that she's just so petty. She, <laughs> you know, not everybody's met. Fortunately, hopefully, none of us have met like you know a Tamburlaine or um, a tyrant. But she's she's her her evil is is so little she's she has this mean littleness to her her villainy is kind of it's almost lazy 
in its spite. And I, I just love that because everybody's met some, or nearly everybody has, has met somebody like that. You know, they, they haven't necessarily meant, met an evil tyrant, but everybody's met a Reagan. Uh, other thoughts of Dan? Um, just an idea. I'll speak to what Sarah was saying there about the about the kneeling. But one idea about when to, where to place the um, interval might be right when you're about to come upon them unawares the, as messenger. So then it's kind of a little bit of a cliffhanger. So it's right before Lear and um, Perilous are about to, are, are to wake up. So it cut, cuts. They right fall in. asleep during the interval. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, 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 they're already asleep, and then messenger is coming up on them, and then you don't know what he's going to do. He's already taken their books and whatnot. Creep, so. creep, creep, and okay. blackout. <laughs> there you go. And and to, to speak to Sarah's point, it's hard for me to say because I was because I was in the scene, so I don't know how if it was affecting or not. Um, but I do think that th that was deliberately written in. The kneeling part, I mean, as a, as, a, as a bit of a comic device there. And I don't think that it, I mean, I think if played correctly, I think that it can be um, ult like alternately humorous and moving at the same time. So maybe it's just hard to see because we're on Zoom. Mm. There. And the, the, there is a balancing thing. I think you can take mm -hmm. it too far. Um, nice. I think, it, you know, and it's interesting. It, 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 it references, uh, we'll go to Alan in a second here, that uh, the way Mumford seems to function for a lot of the play is you have actually quite affecting scenes and Mumford says something slightly inappropriate. So other people are doing kneeling and things that are quite, quite affecting and then Mumford has a go uh, or, you know, somebody else has a go and then it's that's too far. Um, and and uh, and and the scene has to be pulled back, and there's there's something quite nice about that, and, and the fact that they keep Mumford on retainer is because he's actually obviously very good at fighting. Um, you know, he's not just there for comedy support; he's actually got to be quite a big, burly, uh, uh, strong fighter. Uh, whoever's playing it, uh, Alan, uh, I saw other people. Very, waiting very much the same thought I'd had that, particularly on that scene, I think Mumford's line is there do chop away at the foundations of the of that to stop the audience getting too intense you know almost finish what is a very very heavy scene with a bit of light relief um and i did find it quite a culture shock when suddenly he morphs from being this <laughs> almost comic drinking mate of the galleon king and i i think one would see him possibly as being contemporary with the king in terms of age and maybe an old drinking chum that suddenly he's, he's also this red art military commander mm. uh, um, and i i loved the opportunity to get sort of the really sarky jabs in at the welshman mm. um you know there, there were some nice lines in there which i hadn't actually looked at ahead of time and it was just i spotted them coming and thought right let's just sort of stick a bit of venom into this one uh lois yeah something i wondered about with mumford was you know tarleton did play his prize he was an expert fencer as well and had uh, demonstrated this and this would be a really interesting role for him because he would be doing comic stuff and then would suddenly start doing all this amazing fighting and uh, you know what a mm. what a surprise for the audience if they hadn't seen him like that before mm. Yes, I like that, and also shows that there is a greater range to what you're expecting a clown to be able to do as well. That you know that the, the you know there's there is there is some you know timing and weight to Mumford as well as all the uh, all, all the comedy business, and it's not extreme comedy business either. It's it's, it's plot subtle. driven. It it is you know it is connected to the scenes that he's in. He's not uh, you know it makes sense. It's character driven. It's um, uh, it works in that way. Uh, I saw other hands, but I've forgotten who was waving. Um, Elizabeth. Uh, hey there, Rob. I just wanted to say how much I just enjoyed today so much. I thought the, the performance of today's session was so incredibly good. Um, what I loved particularly was the speeches. I thought the speeches came across really well, I just um, across the board. Um, I was comparing this one to the Duckman play. And I thought that <laughs> oh, no, no, no. And Don't that's go the there. end for me. No more for me. Put it in the chat. 
Uh, or, wait, or wait five minutes, we'll talk about it after. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, on the, uh, but on the subject of acting, um, I thought the, the um, ambassador was well slapped. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and the screen froze actually at exactly the right moment when you ducked to the side, the video image just froze. Yes, it was so, it was, I, I assume it was just because there was so much suddenly change in the, in the screen that, that your, your data flow just went, nope, that's too much. Um, or it was just dramatic. Um, it was just Zoom has a sense of the dramatic because it did look actually really good. Like you were you were nursing your 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 slap with your final lines before you exited, so it, it looked actually rather good. <laughs> um, other thoughts, Alexandra? Yeah, I had a thought on on the comedy stuff as well. I think um, it, throughout there's a lot of comedy potential throughout uh, both what we did today and what we did yesterday in these little moments and I think you know everybody did a, a great job of bringing out these little sort of uh, bits of funny in the midst of serious without it taking it out uh, without things necessarily taking away the things I think that's that's what this this would need directorially is is um, with with you know interactions like Mumford's uh, or rather insertions like like Mumford's kind of um, points but also with things like the um, the kneeling scene and and the bawdiness all the bawdiness of yesterday you know um, I think what would make these a very useful feature as opposed to a problematic thing to juggle um, is if they these things are directed in such a way that we find them to be plot driven to be to be character driven to be um endearing or you know for example the the, the kneeling can be endearing as opposed to ridiculous um and then we care it the the comedy helps us care more about the seriousness rather than undercutting it and it also is i think it's a space thing as well uh you know the the primary kneeling is between uh you know lear and cordella um it, it and if that's quite a tight exchange uh of, of 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 movements and then when it comes to the other people kneeling there further away and it's 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 a slightly different thing so you have something that could be con directed to be quite close uh which is supposed to be contained and emotional and then you have other people piling in and that's where the laughs come and that feels appropriate to, uh, to, to uh, take the edge off some of those 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 scenes. And you know, Mumford is the last one and is the most absurd. So there's a certain distancing that sort of feels implied in that. Um, and those kneels can be sort of assisted also if it is effectively most mostly two people. You know, if there's a chair or there's a you know there's there's some sort of thing to make it so it's not so big a move uh, as well. That it's uh, it's something that's uh, relatively contained. Uh, Helen. Picnic chairs. But something else for Roger to carry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's he, general porter as well as everything else. <laughs> yeah. But what um, the thing that I was dreading, because I really didn't know what to do until I found myself actually saying it, was the perilous offering his flesh for Leah to eat, <laughs> which is... I just didn't know what to do with that. But I mean, if you do it for it, play it for its shock value and then treat it as if it was a joke was all I could think of in the, in, in the heat. But it is a very difficult bit. It, it's one of those moments that does feel like it's supposed to be a bit, you know, it is supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be a, a, a but I, I'm not sure, um, you know, because we do have it uh, this this kind of uh, cannibalistic uh, reference in a, a, another play, which we actually, I think we read about the same time as we read this and we went, hang on, we had this the other week. Um, so it, it, it might also be a semi-reference to other, other you know, that this is, is happens more often than we think. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's a really it's a, the, there are lots of bits like that, Francis. Yeah, the um, the the scene with Perilous offering his arm uh, for the famished Lear to eat reminds me of a um, Monty Python audio sketch, which wasn't referenced in the first look I checked. So I will um, put it on the uh, I'll put it on Facebook uh, later. It's very Excellent. funny. <laughs> Um, uh, any, uh, 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 Dan. 
Uh, just to address the, the 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 cannibal scene, I just I thought it was played fine because it was played pretty honestly, and honestly, I think the comedy is going to come out mm. in it because I mean, the fact that she's so earn oh, perilous is so earnest mm. in, in in the offer. So yeah, I mm. thought it was it was easy to play off of that because you weren't playing it up. Even if you were playing it up, there would be a way to do, to to react to that as well. But it was much easier because you were being honest to 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 respond honestly. Yeah, it's the earnestness mm. of Perilous that might might make it funny. That's the earnestness is is what's important, and actually your your fundamental decency uh, uh, is 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 what makes that work. Well, that sadly means that they're all frozen, and I can still move, and I'm still being recorded. So that's all we have time for. I'm going to thank all these wonderful people for all their wonderful work. Thanks to all of them.